Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go over a lot of good information. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to compare uh, the real estate housing starts, which I propose is an inflationary time in the real estate cycle, and then compare it to other kind of leading commodities like oil, and then a lagging commodity like gold. Gold accounts for things after inflation's already in the system, at least that's kind of how I look at it. Uh, and then oil is the most sensitive to inflation, which usually would mean to me that oil would be a leader move first and then gold would come lagging behind it. So what we could do is we could an analyze oil and compare it to gold to see if, if they actually link up, which means that if we see oil go up because of whatever reasons, we should see gold go up just lagged behind it, which means that we could use the real estate expansion phase as a leader for oil and oil a leader for gold because oil uh, is the number one commodity. It's also used in energy, which means that it is used absolutely everywhere in a whole bunch of different products. So if oil goes up in price, one could assume that the CPI eventually would go up uh, because of the increase in oil price and the oil oil not only does it is it in transportation costs uh, it's also in the the actual products themselves so this commodity which is the number one commodity used like plastics and all sorts of stuff is used everywhere if that were to go up that is an input cost for all those products therefore those products would go up in price eventually uh, so I'm going to touch on some things kind of high level so everybody understands and is basically level loaded on the same page. So first I'm going to go over the, the real estate cycle. Uh, the real estate cycle has four phases. It has a recovery phase, an expansion phase, a hyper supply phase, and a recession phase. The real estate cycle, in my opinion, drives where money flows into investments. And the reason it does that is because the real estate cycle has an impact on interest rates. When you're in a recovery phase, what that means is that you built too many homes. I'll start with the hyper supply phase. We built too many homes, uh, inventory gets replenished, and home prices start to decline. So it's increasing vacancy and new construction. New construction is the building of new homes. We build too many new homes. We basically put, put uh, too much inventory out there, and we get a decline in price. It doesn't have to be a large decline. It could just be a slowdown, but it's a slowdown or a, a, a decline in price. In a recession, that is what that decline is. So we built up inventories here and then we have a sell off. In a recovery phase, what happens is we decline in our construction. Our, const our, our new construction of home builds goes way down and we go through a recovery process where our inventory starts to get drawn down. When that inventory gets drawn down in the recovery phase, it's usually a low interest rate, low inflationary environment because we are not putting new new loans against new homes, which is inflationary. Uh, I propose that the real estate cycle is what drives that inflation, the credit expansion or the leveraging up. So inventory gets drawn down, home prices start to go up, and then we get an imbalance of supply demand. Our inventory gets drawn down to critically low levels where we are forced to build new a lot of new homes. And when we build more new homes over the long-term occupancy average, which is this line here, we go into an expansion phase of real estate. And in, in an expansion phase of real estate, you see drastically increasing home prices at the beginning of it, which then kicks on us building more new homes because people are more willing to buy new homes if there's not enough existing homes in the market. And we get a huge boom in real estate in an expansion phase. That expansion phase has new loans against new homes, which if you look at a fractional reserve lending system, that means that it's expansionary. You're, you're increasing the M2 money supply. You're increasing how much money is in the system uh, through credit creation in this expansionary phase, which eventually, because it's a highly inflationary environment, will put pressure 
on interest rates to go up. And interest rates are nothing more than people owning bonds and an inflation rate that is greater than the interest rate that's being paid on the bond. What that does is it puts it in a situation, what we call a real negative interest rate. And when inflation is greater than the interest rate, and it's it's a real negative rate, it means that you're losing money. So bondholders are going to sell their bonds until interest rates go up to a spot where they deem the return on the bond sufficient for the inflation rate. So they're going to sell bonds until it goes above the inflation rate and has a real uh, interest rate. But that takes time. It's, the stuff isn't fast. Interest rates directs where money flows in an economy. So if we have an increasing interest rate environment, it's completely different than the declining interest rate environment. We've been in a 40-year declining interest rate environment from what I, my opinion is demographics-driven. Gen X is smaller than the baby boomers. And real estate, really, we didn't build a ton of homes. We had one area, 2000 to 2008, which was kind of a bubble because we it was it was a loan a fictitious loaning of of money i mean they just kind of flung these things out there it wasn't actually a real demographic driven um, event but in a de- in a declining interest rate environment for 40 years it's going to push stocks higher uh, so since 1980 we've been in a declining interest rate environment which puts pressure on stocks to move up because their pe ratios uh, and people prefer to own stocks because you can't get a return in bonds. Your bonds are continually going down. Now, in a declining interest rate environment, bonds also go up in price, existing bonds, because they pay a higher interest rate than new bonds that pay lower interest rates. They go up in price until those two cash flows equal each other. So we've been in an increasing price environment for bonds and stocks because of the decline of interest rates. What I'm proposing is that we've messed up the housing cycle last cycle, which we now have a shortage of homes. That shortage of homes is going to drive home prices higher. And then we're gonna drive a mass a massive building in new home builds. That's going to be very inflationary. That inflation is gonna put a huge real negative interest rate on bonds, which we have right now. Interest rates are going to go, they're going to be pressured to go higher, which means no one's going to buy bonds. And if they're going to hold them down, they're going to have to buy a lot of bonds, <laughs> a lot, because you're going to have no buyers. And eventually they're going to make up 100% of bond buying if they're trying to hold rates as low as they are. I think they're not going to be able to hold them down. I think they're going to have to let them um, rise up. Uh, it's going to be too inflationary. That's my guess. Now, uh, I'm going to look at uh, something here. I've got a lot of charts here. What I have in the upper left here is the the housing starts. This is residential real estate. And remember the cycle. The the housing starts, you can see the real estate cycle go up and down through housing starts. The recession, recovery, expansion, recession, or hyper supply phase up here, recession. And you can see it just go back and forth. Remember that expansionary phases are inflationary. In the 1970s, we had an expansion phase and another expansion phase, and in between it, we dipped. If you were to look at a gold price in the 1970s, this is that dip, is is the the real estate market going down and then coming back up. What I have on here, this is the long-term occupancy average, the red line. This is residential real estate, new home builds. And whenever you go above the red line, you get an expansion phase, which is going to be inflationary. The bigger the move up, the more inflation. Now, I've got these green and red circles. What are those? What that is, is the commodity to stock ratio. This is your valuation. Whenever it's green, you want to be buying commodities. Whenever it's red, you want to be selling commodities and buying stocks. You want to sell your stocks and buy commodities down here. And look, look at this. We are, we've never been this cheap on this ratio um, for, it's been actually over a hundred years. Uh, in fact, I don't think it's ever been this cheap ever, which means that the largest difference in valuation between stocks and commodities has happened. Uh, and what and what caused that happening is the decline of interest rates. The decline of interest rates, everyone piled money into bonds and into uh, stocks. 
And if you notice, the green circles are always at the beginning of an expansion phase of real estate. And we're going into another expansion phase of real estate, which means that we have the same market conditions that are ripe for commodities to go up, um, just like we have in history. And the red is the sell signals. When, it, when, the, when the housing starts go below the long-term occupancy average. Now, there's a difference here between this cycle and, and other cycles. We are at the end of a 40-year decline of interest rates. We're at the end of it, which means that money's been piling into bonds and stocks with no repercussions because rates have been going down, pushing prices higher. If interest rates go up and we go into a increasing interest rate environment, not a declining interest rate like the past 40 years, to an increasing interest rate environment, that changes the market dynamics. It changes the pricing of, of all these assets. When it changes the prices of those assets, what you're going to see is you're going to see money rotate out of stocks and bonds, which we haven't seen in mass. I mean, this could be a big move where all of this money rotates into precious metals and commodities. We haven't seen this in 40 years, an actual true increasing of interest rate environment. If that were to happen, it's going to take a lot of money. I mean, a whole bunch of money at valuations that have never been this out of whack and move it into a very small sector in comparison to those in precious metals and commodities. You're going to see the biggest moves probably of anyone's lifetime because we've never been so out of whack in the valuations of, of, of the commodity to stock ratio which is right here. And I'll show you real time what that looks like in some other, in some other uh, graphs down below. Now, we understand that we have the lowest valuations in commodities ever. We have a market condition that is exact. It's just prime to, to have commodities move up. Now, what I did is I took the housing starts and oil price and I compared them to each other. Uh, this is nothing. This is just straight up, just, just charting. Housing starts going down is going to put pressure on commodities to stay low. When this goes above that like 1500 mark, 1 1.5 million, it's going to start to put pressure on oil lagged a little bit to move up. And that's what we see. We see this move here is this move here. It's just lagged by six months to a year. And basically, this is a move of oil moving on up. And it's lagged, you know, a year or so. So 7-1, 2005, 7, about a little over a year, 7 one, 2008. So it's a couple years, a couple years lagged. And, and that's what we see is whenever we go into an expansion phase of real estate, we see oil really start to take off. And I would say that this move here is this move here. That guy here is this guy here. And it's just, it's just shifted to the right, the oil price it takes a little bit of time for this money to get into the system and, and work its way through then we had a decline and there's the crash we went sideways for a while because we were in a recovery phase and now we're coming back up above the 1500 again right now and this is going to take time guys this isn't it's not overnight it doesn't happen in, in days it happens in years and I have a feeling that this is going to move on up, which is going to put pressure on oil prices to move on up, which is going to put pressure on interest rates to move up. And, and we're going to see a big rotation of money and it, it, it gets the ball rolling. Now, I've got here oil versus gold price. So what this is, I, it's just a straight up um, uh, oil versus gold. And you can kind of see a relationship. You kind of not. I mean, this, this could be here. Uh, this came up. It, it, there's there's you know a bottom of, of a bottom we came up here and it, it it works pretty well on a straight up move and what i did is i said well let's try moving this oil graph around so what i did is i shifted oil uh to the right so let's say that that gold was lagged behind oil by 1.78 years so i i shifted the oil graph this way by 1.78 years and see how it aligned and see if we could see any alignments. And we can see, you know, little alignments here where the price basically matches the oil price. And then we had the decline, they printed a bunch of money and they 
they elevated gold one last time. Uh, you can see how this kind of all aligns. We, ha we had this move higher, we had the move higher, and the, the dip and the dip, we went sideways. And I don't know what's going to happen here because we had a big dip here. And I don't know if this is going to drop a little bit before moving higher. Now, I'm just playing with numbers, guys. This isn't like it's for surely right. And I, I, I shifted even this more over. So I shifted it 1,200 days or 3.28 years, which means that the housing prices in an expansion phase go up, oil goes up, and then I, I shifted it over oil, 3.28. So I'm saying that gold and the move, price movements of gold is lagged behind the oil price by 3.28 years. And this is what the chart looks like. There's the three years, 3.28. And I moved it over, and you can see that there is a correlation of this lag here. And I, I tried to line it up as best I could here. Uh, there's a move downward. We kind of come to this end here. The bottom, bottom, we move on up, we move on up. And it might be off a little bit. I mean, it might be less than 3.28, and we can move it a little bit to the left. Uh, and I've got another one. Let me see if I can find it down here this is oil lagged by a thousand days 2.73 years uh, to see if i can get this to line up a little bit better i'm just shifting the oil curve now the oil curve is multiplied by like 20 i think it was 20 times to shift the, the curve up it was 10 or 20 times to, to get these two curves somewhat close i wanted this curve right underneath it and this one lines pretty well and and how everything kind of lines up We've got the decline, the bottom and the bottom here line up pretty well. Uh, we came on up, we came on up. We got the, the drop and then the move over. So I think that 2.73 years is probably almost the best match uh, as I was trying to do this. And if you notice, we're sitting here, we had this drop in oil. And I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know if it, it's going to drop and then move on up just like oil did. Again, guys, I'm just playing with numbers to show you guys what I'm seeing and see if I can find correlations here. But uh, we very well could have a little bit of a drop before moving higher. Maybe we don't, but we've, we've already kind of had a drop. And I do know that there's limitations. Like there was a large drop here and, and there wasn't as big of a drop here. So hopefully we're close to a bottom in oil. Now I'm going to go back up. Uh, I'm going to go back to the oil price. Now, the oil price, just looking at it straight up in dollars, uh, we've been moving on up. And I think that what's next, and this is going to take time. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight. We we broke the downtrend here. We're coming on up. We broke out of it. And I think eventually we're going to end up somewhere up here and touch the top of this guy. If you were to look, this is a logarithmic chart. This is probably about $500 just above it. So it, I think we could potentially hit two, three, four hundred dollar $400 per barrel oil, given we have a good amount of inflation. So I, I think the potential's there. I don't know if it's going to hit it, uh, but I'm just saying that the potential is there to move up, which means that if we were to get that type of move, that we would have to be in an, a, a very large expansionary phase of real estate. And I grabbed some data. This was updated just recently and it says the housing shortage we need five more million homes needed for supply to catch up to demand we need to build five more million homes i don't think we've ever been this out of whack in the real estate market it says there's roughly 140 million homes in the united states but according to a recent report by realtor.com this isn't quite enough in fact there's an there's such an imbalance in the supply of homes and the number of people who want to become homeowners that the u.s needs 5.24 million more homes to be sure, this shortage didn't spring up overnight, and housing demand from home buyers being a little ahead of supply isn't uncommon. For example, in 2019, the same report found a shortage of 3.84 million, but the red hot 2021 housing market has certainly made it worse. It didn't, it's not making it worse. It's just the result of being short. Now, if you look at this, this is the area under the curve. This is the housing shortage. Whenever you underbuild under the average, you develop a shortage. This here, this area under the curve here, is so much greater than any other area under the curve before 
that we could have the largest expansionary phase in real estate that we've ever seen in anyone's lifetime. And that spells opportunity for increasing interest rates, a high, high inflation rates, and for a rotation of money into commodities and, and precious metals. And we've never been on a valuation metric this cheap. Now, looking at the valuation metric, I put in some new metrics. Um, here is the metric of the CRB index to S&P 500. This is the stock, the, the commodity to stock ratio. When it's going down, stocks are outperforming. Now look, we are entering a, an expansionary phase in 2020, and that expansion phase is gonna put pressure on commodities and, pre and precious metals to go higher. We broke the downtrend of this ratio, and this ratio is just recently starting to break to the upside. Here's the, the zoomed in on this. So I zoomed in on this portion down here, 2020 and 2021. Uh, this is the commodity to stock ratio. And look, we've got our, our pattern that developed. We've been coming through and we've just broke to the upside, which means that commodities are going to outperform stocks. And it will probably outperform for a very long time, given the market conditions in our real estate uh, cycle. If we're short 5.24 million homes, we can't build that overnight. We're going to have, it's going to take time. And I think it's probably going to take at least eight to 10 years to build all those homes, which is going to be very inflationary, depending on how many we build. If we don't build, an, if we don't build a lot, it's going to take us longer to get through it. It's going to be a longer cycle. If we build a lot, it'll be shorter, but more inflationary. And it will put massive pressure on interest rates to go up and a, a lot of pressure for that money to rotate into commodities and precious metals. Now looking at the gold to oil ratio, and this ratio basically goes down and it'll break out to the downside at the beginning of a commodity boom. And why is that? What have I been explaining this entire time? I've been explaining that real estate and expansionary phase is inflationary. The first impact which, which has the most inflation sensitive commodity is oil. Oil then works its way through the system, creating inflation, and then is seen in numbers like the PPI and CPI. That will push gold higher. The first mover is this, and we should see this ratio where oil outperforms gold and break this down, this, this lower trend line. When we break out of this channel, what that is signifying is that we are about to embark on a commodity boom and look what we're doing we're trying to break the bottom of that channel this channel is set up I, I set this channel up for a commodity boom i knew it was coming uh, so i started the channel in 2020 2000, uh, it was august uh, someone had recommended that because i talk about stocks a lot uh, even you know with people at work and whatever they said start a channel you because i was getting a little annoyed with some of the people on youtube and i didn't think their data was correct uh, they were saying that we were in a housing market bubble. Uh, they were selling fear. And I was like, I, I can't let that go on anymore. I, I got to get this information out so people can benefit. And this is some data. I think we're going into a commodity super cycle. And oil, I think energy is, is going to be an incredible spot to be. Uh, usually when you do the analysis on a lot of these things, that energy is some of the most leveraged plays, precious metals do very well. Copper, I think, is going to do well. Uh, I think tin is going to do very well. Nickel. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of different ways to play it. Now, the least risk way to play this is through physical precious metals. I think because if we run into very expensive energy prices, uh, it's going to push metal prices higher. It doesn't mean that the mining companies at some point in this in this cycle, they may not go up as much as what most people think because their margins are going to get compressed as their input costs go up, even though the metal price goes up. Uh, so the least risk way, I'm not saying it's the most leveraged way, it's the least risk way is to hold the physical metals. And I think that's a, 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 good, a good bet. And I like platinum and silver. Those are the two that I like a lot. Gold is also a good one to play it with because it's a monetary metal and it's going to get repriced. Uh, looking at energy, energy doesn't have the input cost. They're the ones, their product is what's going up. 
And if it's the most inflation sensitive, and I think it's going to be a very inflationary environment, I chose high debt companies, companies that were sold off at the bottom quite dramatically. Because if the product you sell is the most inflation protected commodity, if, it, if it's going to go up the most with inflation, it's going to inflate your debt away. And if people at the bottom of the market were the most afraid of debt, it means that those companies were sold off the most, giving the greatest value of any company. So these middle to high cost producers with high debt, which were getting close to bankruptcy, got sold off to pennies on the dollar, literally pennies on the dollar, like one penny for one dollar. And if we were to get repriced higher with oil, and let's say my prediction, and it's not really a prediction, let's say oil gets to two or $300 a barrel. Those companies that I'm in are going to get priced so much higher that it is going to be ridiculous. We are talking maybe even thousand fold increases because I bought it for one penny on $1, literally on some of these companies. They, they went from a hundred dollars down to a dollar <laughs> and then you buy it. It can go a hundred X to get back to its old, old all time high where oil was in the hundreds. And if it doubles that, if oil goes up to 200 or 300, I mean, you're, you're looking at returns that are un, unimaginable from valuations that were so cheap that we've never seen before. And I think that's possible. Now, uranium is another one that I think is really good. I know a lot of people, they get confused on why I always price things against oil, uh, gold. Gold is the standard. It's called the gold standard. We had a gold standard. I price it to gold because gold is the mechanism for the accounting of inflation in the system. And when it does that accounting, it accounts for inflation during an inflationary phase. Market conditions like we have today, which is an expansion phase of real estate, that's when that accounts. That's when the money gets out of stocks and bonds and rotates into precious metals, and it does the accounting. Now, how big is this market? How big can this gold market be? Now, I also put that in here. It's, I put it in here. This is the gold to monetary base ratio. What this ratio is telling us is how much gold has accounted for the monetary base. We broke out of this descending wedge pattern to the upside, and I think we're ready to, to account for it very soon. Remember, gold is lagged. It's lagged behind oil. It's lagged behind the expansion phase of real estate. And I think we're going to get a big revaluation way up to maybe three and a half or four, or maybe higher. Maybe we go all the way back to five. That means that gold's going to have to reaccount for a lot of money that's being created in the system. And keep in mind, they keep, they keep printing money. And this ratio continues to go down the more they print, which means that it's going to account for even more money in the future if they continue to do what they're doing. And another opportunity here, this is the XAU to gold ratio. And what this is, is the gold and silver index versus gold. And we've been in this valuation range around 0 0.25, 0 0.3, which is kind of the average over history. But we went to this extremely low level of 0 0.05. What this means is that if gold accounts for the monetary base and rockets higher, it means that the gold and silver index and in mining companies can go up to, it can compress against gold all the way up to, let's say, 0.3 from a 0 0.5, 0 0.05. That is six times. It means that your leverage to the price move of gold can be six times the six x the, the price of gold. If gold goes up eight or 10 times, that means you go up six times the eight or 10 times. So there's a huge opportunity here for a, a very large asymmetric bet in gold and silver companies where they get repriced much higher and it could happen very quickly. I just don't know when that's going to happen. We can see all the correlations here. We can see the valuation and how it aligns to the expansionary phase of real estate. We can see that the ratios like the CRB index to stock ratio, the S&P 500, how that's breaking to the upside. We can see oil going higher. We can see the expansion phase of real estate and how many homes we have to build and how that's going to impact inflation and interest rates. 
if this all plays out the way that I think it might play out, we could see a revaluation of commodities and gold and all this stuff uh, vastly higher, vastly, vastly, vastly higher, like mind blowing higher. And what what I think you need to do as an investor here is don't worry so much about the short term movements. You have to focus on this big picture and the valuation here. This may take some years to play out. It may take five or 10 years, may take 15 years. I don't know the exact timing of it. But if we can if we can buy these cheap assets and hold on, I think that's probably the best course of action because when this does revalue, and I don't know how it can't revalue, it's got to revalue at some time because you can also look at supply demand curves and they're all jacked up for a lot of these materials, which means that since we have the supply demand jacked up, and we have no accounting of the money in the system, when this all unwinds, you're going to see massive compression of ratios of whatever that commodity is in relationship to gold. And gold is going to account for all this money that's been created. You're going to see this massive valuation difference of some of these commodities go to the over, from the most undervalued they've ever been to the most overvalued they'll ever be. And that that movement is going to create an incredible amount of value for investors. And again, I don't know the timing. It's going to take some time, but uh, I think it's going to be absolutely massive. And what we've been waiting for is this expansion phase of real estate. And it's right in front of us. It's right there. We've seen, we're seeing home prices shooting higher. We're starting to see new homes being built. And, and this is it. We're right there at that point where we could see a very big move uh, to the upside for an expansion phase of real estate, which is going to work its way into oil, it's going to work its way into gold, it's going to work its way through the entire system. Uh, so, yes, I would be buying a house if it were me. Uh, yes, I would be buying oil, which I have done. Yes, I would be buying uranium. Yes, I'd be buying natural gas. And precious metals. Precious metals are still an incredible value. It seems like nobody wants to own them. Everybody thinks that this is manipulated and, hold, and held down. They're not going to be able to hold this down, in, in my opinion. They can maybe hold a small, you know, they may delay it a little bit, but when, when the inflation comes, everyone's going to pile into it and th there's no way they can stop it. It's probably going to make it even worse. It's going to make it even a, a bigger moonshot to the upside. So uh, my take on this is that we're, we're entering a large commodity boom. Uh, we can see it. Uh, if I were to go right here, we can see it. The outperformance here in the CRV to S&P 500, it's breaking to the upside right here. It's clear as day to me. Uh, we've got the downtrend line that's broken. We are still at incredibly low valuations. This is going to revalue all the way up to probably 0 0.4. 0 0.4 is an eight times increase. I mean, we're talking about massive moves here, absolutely massive moves and eight times increase in commodity prices. And if you're in some of these mining companies or whatever it is now, I like the royalty companies. The royalty companies don't have the input costs. Their margins are going to get compressed. So physical metals is what I like. The, that's kind of the base to go off of lots of physical precious metals. That's 25% of my net worth, roughly. Royalty companies are good. Big diversified mining companies that mine all of this stuff because it'll capture the majority of it. Something like a BHP, a Rio, a VALE. Uh, they're all very they're all down a lot right now, too, which is gonna afford a very good entry point. Cost average in if that's what you guys want to do. Again, this is my what I'm doing. It's not financial advice, it's just my opinion. You can listen to my opinion and take it to a financial advisor and ask them, because I'm not qualified to do that, but uh, this is what I'm seeing, and I think there's some allocation that that could go to commodities here because they're so cheap. Uh, real estate's going to be good for for a good while, and I think it's going to go up quite a bit. Uh, I think that banks could be good because they're going to be making a lot of loans. They're going to make some money. It's going to be a big loaning uh, against new homes, uh, and then some of the metals. I use royalty companies like copper, nickel. Uh, Tin is very good. I think they're all going to do incredibly well. Uh, so if you guys like this type of analysis, subscribe to the channel. Give me a thumbs up. Uh, and thank you for listening. This is Finding Value.